All right, this is American History Quarter 3 Quiz 1 Overview. Mr. Bogoma, we're going to start with the 12 questions. Which of the following best completes this graphic organizer? So last week, our topic was the Great Depression. These are causes of the Great Depression. So we need to figure out which other answer choice is a cause of the Great Depression. And if you remember from our discussion, and we actually watched a video on this, we talked a lot about the uh, collapse of the stock exchange in New York City due to overspeculation. So the answer would be B. You might feel uh, the desire to choose A, increase in consumer spending, but the cause of one of the causes of the Great Depression was excessive consumer spending, not increase in consumer spending, because the increase could have been from a very low starting point. So we're not going to choose A. All right, question two. Which factor most intensified the effect of the 1929 stock market crash? So what intensified the market crash in October of 1929? We talked a lot about uh, investors and companies uh, borrowing money from banks to buy stock. Up to 90% of purchases were made uh, with borrowed money. That's called buying on margin. So we would go with A. Okay, question three. We have a passage here. I always recommend figuring out where it's from. So we know this is something about the uh, the issues Herbert Hoover was facing. And then I start reading. And you're looking for clues, context clues. We have a year, 1925, Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover had warned President Coolidge that stock market speculation was getting out of hand. Yet in his final State of the Union address, Coolidge saw no reason for alarm. Hoover, however, remained fearful. Even before his inauguration, he urged the Federal Reserve to halt crazy and dan dangerous gambling on Wall Street. By increasing the discount rate, the Federal Reserve charged banks for speculative loans. He asked magazines, magazines and newspapers to run stories warning of the dangers of rampant speculation. But presidents in 1929 were not supposed to regulate Wall Street or even talk about the gyrating market for fear of inadvertently setting off a panic. And Hoover backed off. The economic conditions described in this excerpt contributed to what? So this caused what? What do we think here? Well, we know this is going to lead to the stock market crash, which leads to one of the causes of the global economic depression. So we see the clues here. Stock market speculation, speculation, banks, speculative loans, and we know that's one of the uh, reasons for the Great Depression. All right, read the source and answer the question. So we're going to read, this is John Steinbeck. I mentioned him, one of the great American novelists, writing about the Grapes of Wrath. And we have a year, 1939. They were not farm men anymore, but migrant men. And the thought the planning, the long staring silence that had gone out to the fields, went now to the roads, to the distance, to the west. That man whose mind had been bound with acres lived with narrow concrete miles. So we're thinking bound with acres, farms. So we're thinking these are former farmers. Eyes watched the tires, ears listened to the clattering motors and minds struggled with oil, with gasoline, with the thinning rubber between air and road. The wills thrust westward ahead of them, and fears that had once apprehended drought or flood now lingered with anything that might stop the westward crawling. These individuals were affected by the Great Depression because they were what? And this is all connected to, we talked a lot about this, Dust Bowl. And remember, these migrants were Okies fleeing the Midwest because of the Dust Bowl destroying their farms here. We know that they were farmers, but they're not anymore. Now they're traveling the roads west. So we had to make some, some look at the passage and find the clues to connect to 
to a vocabulary term that we've discussed in class, which is Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl was a huge environmental uh, catastrophe brought about by drought, high temperatures, and over farming. So we know here that they were victims of an environmental circumstance beyond their control. Okay, between 1930 and 1970, the population of Oklahoma changed drastically. Let's look at our title here. We have population of Oklahoma, we have population, we have year. We have a big dip here, and it starts right here. Which factor accounts for the population trend between 1930 and 1950? And we just read a passage by John Steinbeck about this. These are people left Oklahoma. Remember, they're migrants, they leave, they're the Okies. So there's when people leave, you have a population drop. So what's the issue here? Poor environmental factors pushed people out. The Dust Bowl pushed people out. So don't forget that, Dust Bowl. All right, next. Question six, bread line in New York City, 1932. So this is the last year of Herbert Hoover's presidency. Lines like the one shown above were partially the result of what? So bread lines, these people are, need food, so there's no money. Why would you not have money? One of the issues with the 1930s, with the Great Depression, uh, businesses closed, we have high unemployment. It reaches 25% of the population has absolutely no employment, no jobs, so you don't have money to buy food. Knowing all of these things and looking through all the answer choices, only one of them really makes sense. Widespread business failures. Selective Service Act is World War I. Sudden increase in agricultural exports would have nothing to do with uh, unemployment and growing demand for payment of military pensions. That's the bonus army, and that's not connected to uh, bread lines. Question seven. Look at the photograph and answer the question. And look, remember, always try to find it. If, if you're lucky enough to be provided with a title, it makes all the difference. This is the Bonus Army, Washington, D.C., 1932. Which statement describes President Hoover's response to the, these protesters? But we know that these are the Bonus Army protesters. So if you remember your vocab, you can remember that Hoover and Congress refused to pay them their World War I bonus early. So a lot of them left, and those that didn't leave, remember Hoover used the army to remove them. And it looked very bad for Herbert Hoover, a bunch of veterans getting tear gassed and their shanty towns burned. So we're, we know, knowing all this, we know Herbert Hoover refused to pay the bonus army, decline in popularity. So what you're thinking is you're looking for the clues and you're trying to play out the, the vocab in your mind, then by looking at the question and playing it out in your mind and then look through the answer choices. Okay, question eight. This is an excerpt from Benjamin Papp Singleton, 1880. Based on this excerpt, what conclusion can be drawn about the colony set up? So he set up some sort of colony. So we have a senator saying, tell us how these people are getting on in Kansas. That's a big clue here. So if you know your vocab, if you can remember all the way back to, to to August and you know Benjamin Papp Singleton, you probably just jump down and start looking for the answers. But I recommend that you always read the source after you read the top and bottom. And so he's talking about carrying people out west to the Singleton colony, uh, house, cabins, pig, sheep, three, four, or 10 acres. So these are people that are going out to become farmers. They didn't get any relief assistance. They went on their own resource. I never helped them. So based on this excerpt, what conclusion can be drawn about the colony set up by Singleton? Well, he didn't help them. These, and if you know your vocab member, Benjamin Papp Singleton was a former Southern slave who helped African-Americans leave the prejudiced South to go West for land, for cheap land to farm. So we know if we can draw these conclusions or just use the source, we see Kansas own resources we should be able to draw some sort of conclusion that they were uh, self-reliant settlers. Okay, question nine. How are Theodore Roosevelt's square deal and Woodrow Wilson's new freedom similar? This is very difficult. This is, you have, there's no source, there's no picture, there's no clues. You just have to know your vocab. So we spend so much time in class talking about vocab. We have to know a similarity between their, their two policy platforms. 
And if you can just remember Theodore Roosevelt, because we spent so much time on him, we know that he was a, one of his big things was he was a trust buster. Maybe you even remember the government act he used to break up trusts, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and trusts were big, powerful businesses and monopolies that controlled a, a large portion of the United States economy at the turn of the 20th century. So they both strengthened federal regulations on big business. They were progressive. Another thing you could think of is they were our, some of our early progressive presidents, and progressive presidents favored the workers over big business. Okay, this cartoon was published in the St. Paul Globe, 1897. This political cartoon represents which motive for American imperialism? And we looked at this in class, and I really stress every time you see a political cartoon is to read every single word inside of it. And for this cartoon, there's only two. Sugar, annexation. So you just have to know which of the following, all of these answers are motives for American imperialism, American expansion overseas. But what, which one based on the cartoon is the correct answer? So sugar is a natural resource. And we talked a lot about Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Okay, so look at the words in these. Second to last question. This poster was published during World War I by the Committee of Public Information. That was one of our vocab terms. Sow the seeds of victory. Plant and raise your own vegetables. Every garden a munition plant. What was the purpose of this poster and others like it? So there were other posters like this, encouraging Americans to do what? Well, if you come home from work and then you, the government wants you or encourages you to go into your backyard and work on your own garden, that's hard work. Not only are you working your day job, but you're growing your own vegetables so that the government has more food to feed its soldiers and our allies in Europe during World War I. It's encouraging Americans to make sacrifices for the war effort. They can't just go buy their, their vegetables. The government wants them to grow their own. The A and B are distractors. They're thinking you're gonna see seeds. They're thinking you're gonna pick A because it says farmers, or you see the woman here and they think you're gonna pick B because it says female laborers. But be careful, look at the clues and think about it. Final question. These are lyrics from the song, Hem for the Working Children. So we know this is a song about working children, 1913. This song addresses what concern about child labor. You just have to read these two stanzas of this poem. And as you read through it, you'll see some clues. Children young and frail who are weary of their burdens and too soon their strength will fail. That's our clue. What do we think? Children were underpaid. No, it's not talking about underpaid in the song. Children were not strong enough to handle the working conditions. Yes, talking about frail and fail, weary, strength, they don't have it, B. So please, when you get these sources, you have to read through them. Read the top, read the bottom, and then read. Then look at the answer choices and pick the one that best makes most sense to you. So that's our overview of our first quiz for quarter three. Hopefully this will help you on your next upcoming quiz.